Father, I pray that as we come together around your word, that you would allow it to sink into our hearts and transform our hearts, transform our lives, and impact us, Lord God, so that we will not leave this place the same way that we came in. Father, you know why exactly the plans happened the way they did today. We are grateful for what we planned, but we are grateful, Lord Jesus, that you come and lead us, Lord Jesus, according to your grace and mercy. So, Father, speak to us and camp your Holy Spirit around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Tell it to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. Now, have you heard of JFK? Have you heard of Billy Graham? All right. You've heard of both of these names. Excellent. In his autobiography, Billy Graham, um, that's entitled Just As I Am, Billy tells a story about how he had a conversation with JFK. He had this conversation with him when uh, JFK was elected president of the United States of America. On the way back to the Kennedy house, Kennedy stopped his car and he saw Dr. Graham there. And he looked at him in his eyes and he started asking him some very deep questions. He looked at Billy Graham and he said, do you believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? To which Billy Graham, an evangelist, preacher, he's like, absolutely. And he started sharing with him, I certainly do. And Kennedy asked him, does the church, does my church believe in the second coming? You know, does, do we have the creeds about, so Billy started going through the creeds and, and, and the scriptures and he started sharing with him as much as he could at that moment and he started talking about how Jesus had come first and foremost and, and how he had lived a sinless life, how he had died on a cross and he was buried but rose again and he talked about how Jesus promised that he was going to the Father preparing a place for his people but that he would one day return and bring and, bring and take his bride, the church church of Christ to be with him. So Graham explained all of these things and shared with Kennedy, and Kennedy was interested. And so they had this conversation, their meeting ended, and he went and drove on. Several years later, the two of them met again at a prayer breakfast or meeting. It was 1963, and, and, and Billy Graham was feeling under the weather that day. He had the flu. He remembers it clearly and talks about it in his autobiography. And in that moment, as he's riding back or getting ready to leave, uh, uh, the president asks him, will you ride back to the, to the White House with me so we can have a conversation? Dr. Graham was feeling weak, and he was feeling the effects of the flu, and so he's like, honestly, I feel terrible, and you know what? I do not want to compromise you and get you sick or bring it to your staff. Therefore, I'm, I'm going to have to pass on this opportunity, but you know what? Why don't we come together another time? Why don't we have a chat at another moment, and we can discuss these things, and you know what? The president looked at him, and very graciously, he says, I understand. We'll meet again some other time. Unfortunately, that was the last encounter that the two men ever had. Later on, in just a while, President Kenny was uh, was assassinated, and they never had a chance. And Billy Graham recounts in his autobiography, man, what if I had gone? He thinks about that moment, that request, how he met that request with hesitation because of his flu. And he thinks about it and it haunted him. He says, what was on the president's mind? What was so important to him, you know, that he wanted to talk to me? Should I have gone with him? That was an irrevocable moment and I didn't get another. How many of us have had these encounters with presidents not I not yet anyways who knows maybe one day God is in control we don't have moments like this or we may not have had moments like this however I would say to you how many of us could agree that we may relate to circumstances similar to it maybe not as dramatic maybe not involving princes and presidents and kings and monarchs and all that but you know what we find ourselves in moments where we have crossroads in our lives where there is a very desperate need there is somebody who needs to speak to us there is a situation that needs our attention there is an opportunity a door that has been opened there is a moment of decision that is right there within us or around us and before us and we come to a place where we 
maybe have or have not acted. There's the weight of that moment, the need in that moment. It's a moment that I think many of us can relate to. Have you ever been there? Have you ever considered a moment such as that? Have you ever considered it by looking back on it now because they tell us that looking back, right? We got 2020 vision. But when we're in the moment, it's not necessarily 2020. We're living in the uncertainty and all of that. And so I invite you today to open up your, bo- your Bibles to the book of Numbers. And I want us to take a look at Mom- Numbers chapter 13. I want to look at a people. I want to look at the people of Israel who had such a moment. Let's explore this moment in which it was an irrevocable moment. They had something that they had to make a decision that was going to impact the rest of their lives. It would have changed the outcome and the trajectory of where they were going. And like you, I believe that we can take, you know, these moments that we encounter, and if we come to them equipped, gleaning lessons and prepared, we can make the right choices and have the impact and the, the trajectory of our lives very, very much so altered. Today, I want to talk to you about Crocs and Covenants, all right? Crocs. You ever, you ever see a Croc? Anybody have Crocs? These are my sons. They don't fit me, obviously. I don't have some of my own, but my little boy loves these shoes. Uh, Crocs. Crocs and Covenants. So open up your Bibles, Numbers chapter 13. Are you there? Go to verse 1, put your finger on it. Let me give you some context. The Israelites had some awesome, awesome encounters with God. They had seen some incredible miracles, did they not? If we recount the events of, of the book of Exodus that is here in the, in the first five books of the Bible, we recount that they had just months prior to the opening scene here that we're about to encounter in Numbers chapter 13. You know, Moses had revealed his great power that God had, had bestowed upon him, this power of God, as he performed one miracle after another miracle. He had, you know, come and turned his staff into a snake and then picked it back up and it went back into a staff. Moses had performed miracles before God where, you know what, dust became lice, where, you know what, day became night and there was darkness all around the land of Egypt. There was miracles upon miracles where the enemy was chasing after the people of God and and God seeing the people before a rock in a hard place. He splits open a sea and allows his people to walk through on dry ground and then he encloses that sea around his enemies and engulfs the the pharaoh and his armies there's miracles upon miracles incredible incredible moments where god displays his power and his goodness to this people moments where god by his affirmation says you know what i am with you incredible moments and then just more recently in the context right before we open up in numbers chapter 13 miriam had been struck with leprosy and then she had been healed of it right there right before them god sent a people who were yearning for food he sent them manna in the desert where there is no provision or mcdonald's or chick-fil-a there is none of that stuff yet god provides manna out of nowhere and not only that when they get sick of manna god sends quail in the middle of a desert he sends these birds, that they may eat meat and not grumble. God had performed miracle after miracle. And not only that, every single day when they look before them, they see a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. By day, there is a smoke that is there that is guiding them, the presence of God. And by night, there is a pillar of fire that is right there leading them and showing them the way. Can you just put yourself in their shoes? These are a people who do not have to say, I wonder if God exists. Hello? This is a people that says, wow, God is here. While God has been active, God has been faithful, God has moved on our behalf, while the Lord is leading and guiding and delivering us, God is here. Supernatural. Someone say supernatural. The supernatural is there. Now imagine witnessing all of these things. Would that boost your faith? Would that boost your faith? Would that just put you on edge and get you excited and make you grow and get going in momentum? Would that change things for you? Well, let's take a look at verse 1. Numbers 13, verse 1. You know what? Supernatural miracles, all of this context, and here we have. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its 
leaders. So let's pause it here. First thing that I want to draw out from the lesson in Numbers chapter 13 that I want to put before you today is that they are commanded to close, yet they are compelled to contemplate. Commanded to close the deal, yet they feel compelled to contemplate the circumstance. See, let me explain what I mean. If you go and take a look at just a couple of books down the road, we're going to get to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Moses is recounting. He's preaching to the people of Israel when they're right, ready to, to enter into the promised land. He is now telling them all that has happened. He's preaching to them their history, and he's recounting the events. He gives us greater details about this specific day found in Numbers 13. He gives it to us in Deuteronomy 1.21. And so in there, he starts saying, not go and send spies and send agents to spy out the land and contemplate it. What Moses says in Deuteronomy 1.21, he says this. He says, these are the action words, rise, go. Attack and seize the land. That's what Moses tells them. Yet in Numbers chapter 13, we open up in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites from each ancestral tribe. Send one of its leaders. See, these guys are told to get up, to rise, to go, and to seize the land. They're told to go and close the deal. Go and finish the contract. Go and sign on the dotted line and go ahead and give that handshake. Go ahead and take possession, enter into your new home and take possession of this thing. That's what they are told to do by Moses. Yet God, in his mercy and grace, foreseeing their petitions before they even express it. Why? Because it tells us in Psalms 139 that before the words are on my lips, you have perceived them from afar. God perceiving their issue, perceiving their lack of faith, God said, all right, Moses, these people are going to be compelled to contemplate. Even though they have seen miracles upon miracles upon miracles, they will want to contemplate once more the, the thing that they're about to go do, what they're about to go inherit, what they're about to possess for themselves. So you know what? In my grace and my mercy, fine, let's humor them. Elect some of the leaders. Send one from every tribe and send them over there so that they can spy out the land that I am giving them. See, God had already said, I am giving them. They're, they're, when God has said something, church, do you have to cross-check? Do you, do, you know, if I say something, you know what, I, I'm human, I'm fine, I'll make mistakes. I try to make my yeses yeses and my noes noes. But you know what, there's sometimes when we just aren't able to fulfill the promise and, and, and the words that we have said, but we have tried with all our hearts. You know, parents, any parent here, you might have made a promise that you weren't able to keep one day. It happens. But when God says something, church... I am giving you this land. Just go look at it since you have to contemplate it a little bit more. Go and look at it. See, what I want you to understand is they were compelled to contemplate when God had commanded them to close. They petitioned for more insight. See, when is enough enough? When is enough faithfulness enough for you to believe? When is enough of God's hand and provision and protection and deliverance and guidance and his, his healing? When is enough enough for us to believe that God will fulfill what he has said he will fulfill? See, God is not man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. He who has begun a good work in you is faithful enough to bring it to completion. That's what the word says. And so in this scenario, these people need more details. All the miracles they had seen didn't seem to help them. I asked you that question. If you had seen it, would that boost your faith? If I look at the track record, I might say, yeah, maybe for a second, maybe for five minutes, a month, a year, maybe for a while. But you know what? If I look at them, I'd say probably not. You see, the issue is at the heart. When we... <laughs> Choose to believe. Believing is a choice. Trusting is a choice. And these people, seeing is not necessarily believing. That's why Paul says we live by faith and not by sight. Here we have a people who, if they just could see it one more time, maybe they would believe it. If they could see the land and scope out the land and have all the details, they might be able to go in and actually close the deal. 
After seeing all the miracles, these people still chose to be led astray, to led away from what God had said, and to experience a whole different outcome, which we're going to get to in a little bit. So God, perceiving their petition from afar, preempts their request and allows them to contemplate. Now, please don't misunderstand me here. I am not promoting or advocating that we should go into things without a plan. I am not promoting that or advocating that we should be devoid of strategy and say, I throw strategy and caution to the wind, and I'm just going to go in, guns blazing, and I'm going to take over everything and fulfill this thing. No, the Bible tells us that because of a lack of counsel, plans fail. Because, you know, when you go out to go build a tower, you should make a plan. We talked about this when we talked about our money series, right, budgeting. It's important for us to have a plan. That is crucial. But there comes a point in time where there's people who are so paralyzed by indecision that all they want is a little bit more information if I just get a little bit more details if I just work out this plan if I can just see the outcome if I can just amass one more thing then I will choose to go and do something and so many people are waiting for things to be perfect waiting for everything to be aligned before they actually take a step of faith and move to do what God has called them see what I'm trying to say today is that we should not be so paralyzed by the miracles so paralyzed by waiting for God to do this or do that what has he said who is he what has he done before he will not change he will not alter he will not deviate from that plan because God is faithful therefore what should we do where do we go here is a people who needed to contemplate rather than move forward If I just get one more piece to the puzzle, then I'll be able to step out and launch into the calling and the destiny and the plan and the the purpose that God has for my life. Just one more piece of the puzzle. The problem with that is you're never going to have all the pieces. See, God calls the unqualified. He qualifies them by equipping them. He calls the lowly of the earth to go and confound the wise. Jesus calls us in the midst of our brokenness, and he says, I have given you sufficient mercy my weakness uh, my grace is is sufficient for your weakness and so move forward in faith you know I, I don't know what's going on uh, in your life today and there's so many different people here and so many folks watching online you all you all might be going through some very crazy struggles you might be going through some very difficult circumstances some of us might be facing relationship problems or physical problems or or, or financial problems or whatever it is maybe it's you're struggling with addictions and you're struggling with bad habits you're struggling with something that brings you back to a sin in a lifestyle that you do not desire to to continue modeling and emulating there is uncertainty in your life there's decisions to be made I don't know what it might be but But you know what? If God can be trusted like we see in the scriptures, there's also an opportunity in the midst of your problem, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your your uncertainty because God is a God that is faithful. What is your problem today? Ask your neighbor, what's your problem? You don't have to tell them. But what's your problem? Does it threaten to overwhelm you? Does it threaten to to destroy you, to destroy your faith, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your home, to destroy your future, to destroy your business, to destroy your your, your wealth, your well-being? Does it threaten to rob you of the peace and the joy and the plan that God has for you? I don't know what the problem is, but I want you to just think about that. Now ask your neighbor, that same neighbor you asked him, what has God said about your problem? What has he said? You know, what has he said about your problem? Rather than contemplating on our issues again and again, God has addressed it in any way? Has he said anything about it? Has he ever made any comments or any, you know, grand statements? Has he ever made a plan? Has he ever made a way concerning my issue? What has God said about the issue? Trust me. What has God said about his faithfulness. What has God said about our sickness and our disease, about our sin and our depravity? What has God said about our future and our assurance? What has God said about the midst of our issues and how he is a God who hears us and knows us and sees us, who hears our petitions, who answers our prayers? What has God said in the midst of your problem? Can you close the deal 
on just some aspect of your issue? Can you just, instead of contemplating it one more time and trying to get another piece of the puzzle or understand it in another way or just put another one of those miracles in your favorite playlist, you know, on your favorites as you watch on YouTube and say, man, whenever I'm discouraged, I'm going to go watch that miracle and I need to get one more before I can launch. Can you just close the deal? Can you close the deal? See, they chose to contemplate rather than closing the deal. The second thing I see here in this passage is that they were citing crocs, not covenants. These guys were citing crocs, not covenants. Verse 21. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob and toward Lebo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron. Say that, Hebron. Hebron. That, that's an important city, but they came to Hebron where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. See, I find it interesting sometimes that the Bible speaks some things in what it does not say. The Bible gives us insight in the places where it's silent, in the things that are overlooked, in the things that are not expressed, in the things that the authors or the, or the participants or the characters forgot to say or chose not to say, chose not to do. We can learn some meaningful things. You ever heard of that city, Hebron? Have you, have you, you know, go back in your memories, if you search your, your Bible knowledge now, all right, where's my Bible scholars? What happened in Hebron? You know, it, by no means is this a big city. By no means is it a significant city, a big metropolis, or, you know what, Hebron was a place where shepherds and herdsmen used to come together and trade. And you know what, the minute you hear that word, the minute that the Israelites came across searching and contemplating the land because God allowed them to go in and check it out before they could come in and close the deal. When they got to that city, they should have started like firing up their excitement. When they got to that city, they should have started saying, you know, oh, I, I know something happened. Oh, oh, this is an important city. They should have started looking at their history and their past and said, wait, hold up, Hebron. Hey, this is the place where our patriarchs and their spouses are buried. Hey, this is the place that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hey, this is the place where the covenant, the covenant keepers, the covenant receivers. This is the place where our forefathers, these are the places that our leaders, they are here. They've been buried here. This is the place where they chose to keep their bones for the rest of the lifespan here, the, the, this side of eternity before they can be, you know, in the fulfillment of the promise. This is the place where our patriarchs are living and where we shall soon be living as well. See, what they chose to say is not the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I don't see it anywhere in Numbers 13. But what they do choose to say and who they choose to name are three descendants of Anak. These guys start talking about these people that have funny, weird names that I can't pronounce properly. Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. They're standing in a place where their forefathers, the people that they revere, the people that receive the covenant from God, the promise that they would inherit the land flowing with milk and honey, that there would be a people, that their nation would be a blessed nation and all other nations would be blessed through them. They are standing where their leaders received God's promises, held on to it and believed one day would be theirs, and yet their eyes are focused on the sizes of the crocs of these three men. See, the descendants of Anak were believed to be military, you know, uh, uh, military strengthened people. They, they were very acclimated. They were very strong. They were very adroit in military power. These guys were good fighters, bottom line. They were warriors. Not only that, these guys were believed to be giants. So instead of looking at the covenant and the covenant bearers of their forefathers, they're looking at the size of the crocs. Oh man, look at those shoes. Oh, these people are huge. They're looking at the issue as opposed to looking at the covenant 
Instead of looking at the patriarchs, they're looking and gazing and preoccupied with their problem. Does this sound familiar? They start looking at the size of those crocs and they start saying, we feel like grasshoppers in comparison to these giants. We feel like we're tiny, insignificant in comparison to these people. They're looking at the size of the buildings. They're looking at the statures of the persons. They averted their gaze from the tombs of their forefathers and they were preoccupied with their enemies. Do you ever feel like that, overwhelmed with your issue, overwhelmed with your problems? You know, I know I do. Sometimes I take a look at the church and I take a look at the challenges of pastoring this great church and I start thinking to myself, will we have meaningful impact in the surrounding communities? I start thinking to myself, will we ever develop enough team members and activate enough disciples and Christians in order to succeed in the mission and the plan and the purpose that God has called us to be a light here in this community? I start thinking about, will we ever have enough money to take care of all the dreams and the big projects that we have to do? I start thinking about, God, Are we going to be able to finally stop spending all this time in facility issues and actually spend time in doing ministry work that makes a change and lasting impact in lives and families? I start thinking, will we see a thriving pipeline of disciples, people who are becoming dedicated followers of Jesus Christ? I start thinking and getting overwhelmed at these issues, especially when I look out on church Sunday morning at 10 a.m. where church starts and I look and there's five people here. Because we're an international church and we decide to come, you know, when the Spirit moves us. Sorry, I didn't mean to go there. That just kind of came. So it's the Holy Spirit. Sorry, Lord. I'm not trying to step on anyone's crocs today. But here's the deal. I start thinking about these things and I get overwhelmed thinking about these things, but then all of a sudden God reminds me, hey, look, where you're standing, I've made promises to some elders. Where you're standing, I've made promises to past pastors. Where you're standing, there's a legacy. And you know what? In this place here, there are promises that have yet not been fulfilled. And I'm a God that I fulfill my promises. I watch over my word so that they can come to fruition, so they can be established and fulfilled. And so when I start thinking about what God has promised, promised, I start letting go of what is before me. And I say, God, if you have said it, God, you will fulfill it. God, help me to be the man. Help me to be the person that is paying the price and doing the work so that, God, you can affect that change and bring those prophecies and those fulfillments through us, through this people, through these members, through this great body of Christ in this community for this time because, God, you have called us and what you have called, no man can say stop or get out of the way. What you have declared to be good, let no devil, let no person declare it to be less than. So God, I trust in you. I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you haven't, you need to start recalling the covenants and the promises that God has made to you, to your family, to your spouse, to your children. Go back and start looking through those journals. Start thinking back through those prayer meetings where you met God and God did something and he spoke something into your life because his words do not return void. They accomplish their purpose. Somebody here give God a praise this morning. These people were commanded to close. They felt compelled to contemplate. These folks were citing the crocs and not the covenants, but also these guys are looking at the abundance of adversaries rather than the abundance of achievements. Look here, uh, verse 27. They gave Moses this account. They go into the land. They, 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 they scope out the strategy, which cities they're going to go through first, what route they're going to take. They start looking at the sizes of the buildings, the stature of the people, the size of the crocs, and all these other issues, and they start grabbing some of the things. God told them, you know, come and bring back a sample of the produce of the land. They go and they do all of this, and now they come back to Moses, they come back to Aaron, they come back to the people of Israel, and right there before everybody, they start speaking their report. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Ding, 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 check the box. Yes, it is the right land. Awesome. It lines up with the promise. Great. Here is its fruit. Check it out. A cluster of grapes that needed to be carried on a pole, suspended by two of these agents who went to scope out the land. Verse 28, the saddest word I think that there is in the Bible at times. But 
But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Pause. How many ites did you hear there? This ite, that ite, terabyte, this byte. All these bites, and you hear these bites, and they're talking about all these different enemies. There's an abundance of adversaries. And so after focusing on the quality and the characteristics of some of the challenges, they start counting the numbers. They start counting the quantity of their adversaries. They start counting the number of the challenges that lie before them. They start listing all of the problems that are still before them that they cannot close the deal, where they have to just consider the crocs these guys start counting the issues amalekites hittites jebusites amorites canaanites they start counting and what they are struck with is not excitement and engagement what they're struck with is terror and as they're looking at the sheer number of issues having been commanded to close if the covenants have been struck and God has made those promises, a more appropriate response for these people would have been to start counting the achievements that lied in store for them. Some of you young students here, y'all play Xbox and PlayStation. You, got, you, you get trophies when you accomplish certain things in those games, right? You get achievements. You unlock achievements when you fulfill certain things. These guys should have looked at all of these names, all of these ites, and said, man, that's one more trophy we're going to get to put on display at home. That's one more story we're going to get to recount of how God was awesome and what he did. That's going to be one more cool adventure that we're going to have when God shows up and he absolutely obliterates this issue. Instead of counting the achievements, these guys are counting their issues have we ever been there oh god the car is broken oh lord my kid got sick oh god i don't know where the next payment's gonna come oh god i don't know how the heck my heater broke and jesus what is going on with this family member they haven't spoken to me we start counting all the issues and we get paralyzed and we get fearful as opposed to counting all these things say god i have one more problem for you to absolutely blow my mind with god i got one more problem that you're going to come in and move upon and you're going to change my circumstance because your word has says that use all things for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose god i got one more thing for you to just absolutely wow me in today have you been there have you been there see these people got counting their issues. And here's the challenge, church. If we start counting our problems and we start listing them again and again, and all we do is look at them, I'm not promoting, again, being without a plan, being without a strategy, being responsible. That's important. But you know what? Some of us talk more about our problem. We talk more about the devil. We, talk, we give more credit about what the enemy has done in our lives than we spend time praying to God who can take care of our issue. Have you ever prayed with people in every single prayer? You know for a fact that they're going to talk about Satan and powers and principalities. And you know what? There are, there, we do not fight with flesh and blood, but we war against power, principalities, and all these things, things unseen. I understand that. There is a real live enemy who wants nothing more than to destroy you and to put you out of your God-given plan and trajectory. However, we have a God that has already declared it is finished. And when Jesus died on that cross, he silenced the grave, sin, and death. And he said, you know what? I am victorious. And at that moment, when, when Jesus did that, there was no devil coming around trying to tempt him again. Because he knows he has been crushed and defeated. But yet when we start counting and recounting and reliving and re-glorying and re-reviewing all of our challenges and problems, you know what starts happening? We start believing the lie of the enemy. Look at what these people did. They went so far as to say in verse 33, we saw the Nephilim. We saw the Nephilim. They're the descendants of Anak. They come from Nephilim. They see Anak. They see all these three giants. They start looking at the crocs and they say, oh man, these people, they're the Nephilim. All right, Bible trivia. What are the Nephilim? Anybody go back to the book of Genesis? What are the Nephilim? These were believed to be the, the, the offspring, the progeny of the sons of spirits, fallen spirits, and the women of men. 
All right? And it's a mystery. We don't truly know exactly what it is. And there's so many debates and all that kind of stuff. However, the Nephilim were believed to be a race of giants that were supernatural in some way. And they're mysterious in how they came about and all this stuff. And so these people start counting all their issues. Amalekites. Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, all these other ites and all these other issues and they're giant in stature and these guys got huge crocs and these guys are very difficult to take care of and they're worthy in battle and they're very formidable and you know what? They start thinking and looking at all of the problems to the point where they start to fabricate things. See, what happens, the enemy, he's the father of lies and he comes to you to tell your problem and your issue and what he does is he starts to get you to believe a lie. See, the Nephilim are nowhere to be found. Why? Because the Nephilim were taken out in the flood yet here they say we saw the nephilim how many times does the enemy start saying to you you're never gonna amount to anything you're a failure you missed the interview or you showed up late therefore you choose not to go and he starts saying to you you are never on time and he starts putting a soundtrack in your mind that's absolutely not true and we have to stop and start looking at the issues that lie before us and place them in the right context and then look at what God has said what he has declared over our lives so that we do not start buying into the lie that the enemy has declared over our identity amen all right, I spent way too long. Here's the point that I want you guys to know. So what? Okay, we're commanded to close, yet we want to contemplate. We want one more piece to the puzzle. We want one more detail, one more data point. We want one more vote of confidence. We are told that we have a covenant, and yet we are looking at the crocs and the issues, and we start counting the abundance of the enemies before us and challenges that lie ahead of us as opposed to looking at the opportunities and the great uh, ability that God will have to move on our behalf. What do we do if that's where we find ourselves? If the problem that we're facing is greater than we can think we can accomplish, if it's insurmountable, it's a mountain that seems to not be able to move from this place and be cast into the sea, it's just impossible. What do we do in light of all of these challenges yet opportunities? What do we do? What do we do? I find that in light of all of these opportunities, in light of my issue and my challenge, in light of that problem, I have an opportunity. I'm confronted with choice. It's all choices. All of it is choices. Why? Because it wasn't 12 spies doomed to die and doomed to failure. It was spies who went out and every single one of them had a choice to make and two of them made the right one. Of all of the people who went, and not only that, all of the people that they represented since they were the leaders of those tribes, every single person except two, two and their future offspring and family, two had to be condemned to die in the desert because of their lack of making the right choice. They chose not to believe. And so the first thing, Joshua responded to the 10 doubters like this. He says in chapter 14, verse 7 and 9, The land we pass through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. See, when you come into the, your land of giants, when your mountain seems too big to climb, when it seems impossible to overcome, let me suggest that you do these very practical things. Number one, you have to choose to believe. Sometimes we have to be like the father in Mark chapter 9 where Jesus talks to the boy, how long has he been like this, dad? How long has this kid been in this circumstance? It has been since he was a child. The dad says, and Jesus says to him, it's possible that I can heal him. Everything is possible for those who believe. And the father goes, Lord, I believe, but help me overcome my belief. See, in the midst of your problem, in the midst of your issue and your challenge, the first thing you do is you just choose, I'm going to believe. Say it out loud right now. I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe God's promises. I'm going to believe what God has said. Sometimes we have so little faith that our belief is, you know, about everything else except what matters. Our belief in our great God is so small sometimes, and it's unfortunate. 
Sometimes we have to pray, Lord, help me to believe, and that's okay. If you're there, that's fine. Pray that prayer, but choose to believe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close here. I'm going to ask the team to come up. Let me just give you a story, and I'll, and I'll rapid fire the other practical points. But here's the deal. There was a college student who was in a speech class, and he was told to give an assignment, a persuasive speech. And so he comes up with the topic, and he figures out, and he does all the study for it. And uh, he decides he's going to teach upon the, the, the law, the principle of the pendulum. Have you ever seen a pendulum swinging? A pendulum is nothing more than, than an object, a line, a rope, or whatever it is that has an object at the bottom that is weighted, and that thing goes and sways from one direction to another. And so he spends about 20 minutes explaining the theory and the law of the, the pendulum and how if you take a pendulum and you release it up at this point and you let go of it on that rope, it will swing. But when it comes back and returns, it will never surpass the initial place where it was released from. It would always be a little bit less. And so what he does is he gets a rope and he attaches it to the top of the chalkboard and he ties a children's toy to the bottom and so he lifts it up and he marks the chalkboard exactly where he lets go of the object it swings and every time it swings back he goes and makes another mark where it came up to and it goes all the way until the object stops and at that point in time where the pendulum is still that means that it's an equilibrium and the forces that affect on it the momentum the velocity gravity all of these different things are in perfect unity and it stands still in that position and so he asked the class, do you all believe in the law of the pendulum? Do you believe in this? Because you see the chalkboard and the whole class emphatically said, yes, I have been persuaded. He, he's about to get a good grade and the teacher comes up and he says, you, you did a good job. And at that moment, the student says, teacher, I want you to sit on the chair that I placed on top of the desk. The teacher looks at him and he says, all right, and he goes. He sits on it. So then the, the kid shows him that he's actually placed a pendulum in the classroom. There's a rope that has been extended, safety wires that has been extended from the middle of the classroom, and it's got a heavy weight on the bottom. So he grabs that, and he looks at his teacher, he brings it up to the teacher's nose who's sitting on top of that desk who's now starting to sweat, and he asks his teacher, do you believe in the law of the pendulum? And he says, yes. And so the student lets go, and the pendulum swings. And in that moment, when it was coming back, never has a classroom ever seen a person move so fast when that teacher decided that his nose was not yet ready to meet the weight of that pendulum upon its face, his face. See, church, some of us, we believe theoretically but God is not calling us to theory. He's calling us to practice. God has called us to believe in his word, not because we wear a chain on our necks and we say we read the Bible or because it sounds good or, you know, what it's the comforting, you know, aphorism to say in those moments of tension and trial that God is good, that he is here, but do we really believe it practically? Jesus doesn't call us to just say yes and then not put the skin in the game and allow him to prove himself that he is faithful. Practically, what do you do in the midst of your trial and your circumstance? I'll invite you to stand with me. Is number one, you believe and you say, I'm going to put my trust in God. That's number two. If we believe in him, belief is always backed up by trust. It's one thing for us to say something. It's another thing for us to actually back it up. You have to trust him. And if you believe, if you trust, there's going to be a natural outflow in your life. And that is you're going to act. I don't know what your issue is. I don't know what you're facing today. You know, it might be healing that you need. It might be an impossibility at home, a challenge at work. It might be a tension within your family. Whatever that might be, or your marriage, or your children. I don't know what your issue is, but you know what? You have to start believing what God has said. You have to start believing in his promises. And when you believe it, you place your trust in it. You back up your weight upon that thing. And you act. Maybe somebody here needs to just start putting some plans into motion. You need to say, Lord God, I told you that I trust you, right? 
I need you to provide for me. And so, Lord Jesus, I'm going to trust you by actually listening to your word and honoring the principles that you have when it comes to giving. Because I haven't trusted you by hoarding it all to myself. I need to give. Some of us need to start actually believing in God, trusting in him, and acting by saying, you know what, God, you are a healer. And because you're a healer, you can heal me instantaneously. You can heal me progressively. And you know what? You have appointed people and leaders. You have given wisdom to those who can take care of me. You've given us enough insight, enough pieces of the puzzles to understand how this temple works. Therefore, God, I'm going to submit myself to the authorities, the doctors, the technicians, and the nurses that have the know-how to, in order to affect healing upon me. God doesn't heal us any less because he uses humans to do the work. He doesn't heal us any less because it only has to come through a pastor's hand in a prayer of faith. You know what? Some of us, we may need to start believing and trusting in God that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Hello. And we start, have to start acting and trusting in God that he knew what he was doing when he knit us together with our spouses. And we need to start acting in a way that honors them and respects their feelings, their emotions, their desires. And we go out of our way so that we can prefer our spouse. I don't know what your issue may be today, what your mountain may be, but are you truly believing in him? Are you truly trusting in him? Are you truly acting? closing the deal, looking at the covenant, anticipating the achievement, and kicking out every lie the enemy has spoken. I'm going to invite you to just close your eyes right now. There might be people here in this place you've never encountered the God who has bestowed, given, declared covenants of goodness over people's lives. You've never encountered this God. You've never had a relationship with him. You know what? His name is Jesus Christ. And he's here for you today. And if you would just believe in him and trust in him and you would act in accordance to what he declared you to do, you would encounter that he is with you and he never leaves you or forsakes you. And despite your problem, he will be with you. If you've never said yes to Jesus, today's your day. Say yes to him now. He will come and cleanse you of your sins, forgive you of all of your issues, forgive you of all your past mistakes and regrets, and he will write your book, your name down in his book of life so that when he returns, you could say like Billy Graham, I know he's coming back for me, and I will abide and live with him for all eternity. If that's you today, online or in person, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you. If you've walked away from Jesus, you need to recommit your life to him. This is your chance. Take this moment. Speak to one of our hosts online. Raise your hand and let, let us pray with you. If that's you, I want you to come on up and I'll talk to you right after service. But for the rest of us, I want you to close your eyes. While you contemplate, while you consider that question, I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. These altars will be open, and you're welcome to come and spend time with the Lord. He can meet you in your seat, but you know what? There's something about us coming to the altar as a step of faith, saying, Lord, I'm going to choose. If I, if I haven't been able to overcome my issues and my challenges and my impossibilities on my own, God, I'm going to just take this opportunity as a single, simple act of me demonstrating that I believe in you and trust in you by coming and asking someone to pray with me to also believe in the same for me. So Father, I pray right now that in the sound of my voice and those watching today, Lord God, wherever they find themselves, Lord Jesus, at home, in the car, at work, wherever they might be, Lord God, online, then those here in this place, God, that no matter the issue or the challenge, whatever the mountain and impossibility, I declare today, God, that you would speak your words of life and truth. Father, I call forth your covenants, that they are the head and not the tail, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made, that, God, you have a plan and a purpose to give them, Lord God, a future and not rob them, Lord God, of a plan. 
that God, you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon them. As they have given, so they shall receive, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God, I declare your covenant that says that, Lord Jesus, if we confess you before man, you will confess us before the Father. If we are faithful to confess our sins, you, Lord God, are faithful to purify and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, I declare your covenant that those who have come to be in Christ will also reign with Christ. I declare today, God, that these people are blessings. Workmanship declared to be, Lord God, appointed ahead of time to do a good work. I declare here today, God, there are homes and families who shall serve you, Lord, because you are good. I declare Jesus healing and mercy and promise and purpose in Jesus' name. God, and I pray that as they go from this place, may your presence richly abide in them. May your grace be sufficient for them. And may, Lord God, your calling, your power, your empowerment, Lord Jesus, be upon them to be witnesses all over the place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.